Welcome back to the podcast, episode 67. As always, you're here with Hoop, Saney, and the infamous Easy Huncho. So much to talk about, boys. The Knicks are up 3-1 on the Cleveland Cavaliers. I, I need to go on and let a rant about that. Uh, the Warriors pull one out against the Sacramento Kings. Uh, the Sixers just swept the Nets. Uh, Kawhi Leonard, for whatever reason, right, still not playing. There's a lot going on. Uh, three people took shots to the groin area. Um, the suspensions were wildly different, and the, the outcomes, I think, were wrong on a lot of them. Uh, what's going on this playoffs, bro? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, um, like you said, uh, they didn't. They this 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 playoff run. It, it doesn't seem like players came here to ball. It seemed like players came here to balls. Okay, because a lot of balls have been hit. Um, in Dylan Brooks' case, I don't blame him because I would take that off. No joke. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> no, I'm playing. Bro, uh, bro's it's weird. To no, I'll say this. Okay. I'll say, yeah, no, just because we're called the podcast, I'm making a uh, little nuts joke. Little anyway. ball cast. <laughs> Um, I'll say this. The James Harden one was stupid. That was an intentional. I don't think that was an ejection. The Dylan Brooks one, he should have been suspended, <laughs> not just ejected. Like, he, the, the replay shows him clearly, like, <laughs> the guarding LeVon. It's as if he, like, stares at it for a sec and just goes for it. And I'm just Hold like, up. bro. Can, can we agree, though, that the Joel Embiid one was by far the worst and it had the, the worst, lightest punishment? The worst one by far. Far by and I'm far. not even and 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 in the words of Charles Barkley, may, might I just say, uh, this is worse than Draymond Green's. This is worse than what Draymond Green got suspended. Yeah, oh, for. oh, I agree, I agree. Uh, but you know why I'm not mad about it? Why I'm not as mad about we, it? We need to because MVP that whole game in the playoffs. We need to no, MVP no. in the playoffs. It was like it, it wasn't That's like exactly the Sixers. What it is, bro? No, 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 no. Exactly but the Sixers, the Sixers weren't catered that game. You know what I mean? Like both officiating was terrible on both ends. Claxton and Bead and uh, Joel got ejected that game, correct? So it's like, what? Well, like I agree with you guys, hey, it's the worst. Dude, dude I agree with you in the sense call. that it's the worst. You're not supposed to attack someone's children for that, though. No, <laughs> I agree. I agree. I, agree. No, no, listen, I, I, I don't not, care what kind of calls are I'm going not, on your boy. I'm That's not a suspension. Dis- I'm not disagreeing with you guys. I'm saying I I didn't voice my. I'm not voicing my concern as much compared to like me voicing it with Draymond getting suspended and Sabonis didn't because everybody got like terrible calls thrown at them on both sides right and ultimately the Sixers swept the net so do does it really matter like they the the Sixers still won and hey, the Nets real, were up real without talk. Harden or Embiid right like does it really matter I don't really care about that end. the Sabonis Draymond could. one I agree the Sabonis Draymond because before Draymond gets suspended Steph Curry has never won a playoff game without Draymond he just won his first one without him right so I agree where it's like okay why is Draymond getting suspended and not Sabonis that's a conversation to be had but the Embiid one I didn't care I, I think there's a world where uh Brooklyn and Philly are actually 2-2 um, I disagree. I think well, I think it was I, be, think I think there's a, I, I say there's a game world out. because if Joel hits if he gets suspended for hitting dude in the nuts, he's out the game. Then Claxton doesn't get suspended, and that game was still very down to the wire. They could have pulled it out. They didn't have it. They had Dayron Sharp trying to check Joel Embiid. All I'm saying <laughs> is momentum. The playoffs are weird. There's a world where they're two two. Shout out Brooklyn. They weren't going to go that far anyway. But all I'm saying is they got robbed. That's what I'm saying. I think uh, I think it's about time we move forward. Um, yeah, nobody cares about the Nets and Sixers. No, 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 cares. no, 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 um, one of the things that aggravates me as a Knicks fan the most is those who, you know, we're not in the playoffs often, but a lot of opposing fans, whether it's the team we're playing or it's just spectators who love to hate on the Knicks, you know, there's, there's plenty of those. There's plenty of those. They always diss the garden and, and it's always like, oh, you know, they, they make it up because it's, it, it's not the, really the mecca of basketball. It's very overrated. Bro, when you go in, there's a reason we say we'll see you in the garden. Donovan Mitchell shot like four for 16 tonight with 11 points. Darius Garland the other night shot the day's date four for 21. Have you, did you watch any of the game? Bro, it's an environment. It's an environment. I agree. I agree. It is I, hard to I play love, in there. I love how like the, like, like the Madison Square Garden, you know, Sacramento Center, all like all these like diehard fan bases are getting in the playoffs because this is what makes the playoffs fun. 
Like when you hear the crowd chant that loud, that's what makes a game uh, like that warrior. I mean, we'll get to the Warriors in a sec, but yeah, I I, I love seeing the Knicks in the playoffs. Um, but moving forward to the actual game, uh, I know before in our predictions, I said it would go to six or seven. I said the Knicks would win. Saney thought the Knicks would win in a fewer amount of games, which might actually be true. They're up three one. Um, should we start with Donovan Mitchell? Should we start with Julius Randle? I mean, Donovan Mitchell for the for the first part. Um, has not been the best player in the series. It's been Jalen Brunson. Um, the Knicks failed two years ago against the Hawks because they didn't have someone that could hold the Garden down, and they had an opponent who was willing to play well in the Garden and Trey Young. Um, Jalen Brunson can now play well in there. That makes it so much more scary. Uh, Donovan Mitchell now needs to face the bubble guppy av- allegations because in the two years that he's played well in the playoffs, I'm talking like averaging 30 plus on this great efficiency. It's been the bubble year and the year after when they were letting like half the fans in. Uh, does this change your guys' thoughts on him at all as a not only as a playoff performer, as a player or someone that could lead you to a championship? Or is this just a case of like a new team, one series? I don't I, I look at it more as like I don't lose faith in Donovan Mitchell based off of what I've been seeing in this series. Um, because Donovan Mitchell is in a situation where, compared to the Utah Jazz, he isn't the only one that needs to be called upon to, you know, answer the bell. He is the only one that we are looking at to, our Cleveland fans are looking at to, you know, lead him to the promised land or a win. Darius Garland and him are a tandem now. He didn't have that in Utah. He had him and Rudy Gobert. Um, And he did as best as he possibly could with that. But now you're in a situation with Cleveland where I'm looking at Cleveland And I'm saying to myself, walking into this series, they look scary. You have two dynamic scorers in DG and Spida, and then you have Evan Mobley and Jared Allen in the paint for the interior defense. On paper, that sounds like a recipe for success. That sounds scary. When I'm looking at the New York Knicks, though, what I like about the Knicks in this series is a lot of what you're seeing with New York is a lot of their role pieces coming in and having their signature moments in this series, if you will, compared to Cleveland. Because with Cleveland, what you're going to get out there is you're going to need to get everything that you can out of Donovan Mitchell and Davis Harlan on the offensive side of the ball. And if Karis LeVert wants to help in with or help out with that, then you're really cooking with something, right? But what are you going to expect out of Osman? What are you going to expect out of Danny Green? What are you going to expect out of Isaac Okoro and Ricky Rubio? Those A lot are of guys are, are invisible getting, out there. Right. And, and when you look at the rest of the guys they're leaving with DNPs like Robin Lopez and, and, uh, and Stevens and uh, Nick, Nito's on this team but the, like they don't have a lot of guys where you're sitting there and you're like oh yeah they can really go as deep as they want to uh, uh off the bench but compared to New it's, York it's Raul and Neto uh but... cool I'm laughing even uh, extra hard because N- OG Nito. OG Nito. OG chalkboard <laughs> o- or OG chalkboard members know about Raul Neto in the podcast <laughs> oh we, we all remember that meme that was going around about him <laughs> we're not gonna say it yet though <laughs> But nonetheless, uh, when I compare that to New York, however, I'm looking at Obi Toppin, who I've loved since he's arrived there, Emmanuel Quickly, who I thought should deserve sixth man of the year, uh, Miles McBride, I, obviously we talk about him and how they use him in spurts because usually Jalen Brunson is going to get 35-plus and he's just going to be content with whatever he gets out of whatever Tibbs offers. And then Isaiah Hardenstein had a big block tonight, a uh, big big block on, uh, I think it was I think it was D. Mitch, I'm pretty sure. One of the well, high might have tried to I know one him. was on Jared Allen. Yeah, and then but, he had one of the other yeah. one on Jared Allen. Uh, but and he gave you eight rebounds. I mean, the, the, the Knicks just have a lot that they could throw at you. Even the stuff that they're not throwing at you, like you know a Derrick Rose that's rotting away on the bench. I hate you, Tibbs. But they just have a lot. They genuinely have a lot that they can work with. And I like New York now. I'm really confident in them going up three one. Uh, the Nook thing would be for them to blow this, and then oh my God, the memes. I'm not, but... <laughs> I'm not victory lapping yet. If you could tell by my tone, you know, I've, I've been like trying to hold it back. Um, I do want to talk about well, the the other part of the predictions we started off with. Saney said that you know they went by, you know, they'd win easily. I thought it would be a grudge match in the terms of if the Knicks were going to win, it was going to be scrappy, and this might be the ugliest series of basketball that has ever been played in the 2010s, 2020 era. Um, they were The Cavs were held to under 80 points the last game. Awful shooting, a ton of turnovers, first a lot of offensive season. rebounds. The first time this season, it, it, it should have been held to like 72 because it was like garbage time and they got a couple points. Yeah, But it's just been awful basketball. But at the same time, I feel like when other teams play the Knicks, 
that's going to happen. Like, it's just going to be garbage basketball. Like, the the Warriors Kings, it's free-flowing. There's three-pointers. It's a lot of ball movement. You play the Knicks, bro, it's just like a, a shoving match. Um, the other part to this, I don't want to linger on the Knicks all day. I, I could do that when if if they win the series. Once again, I don't want to doubt the Cavs. They have a lot of talent. It's not out of this world they can make a 3-1 comeback. Uh, Julius Randle. Stephen A. Smith, right, and Stephen A. Smith fashion goes on in the postgame show. Oh, we should blue skies, New York stand up. Uh, Tim Thibodeau is the go for benching Julius Randle. Like, he always just, you know, it's in the moment, rags on whoever's playing awful, praises whoever's playing. While well, R.J. Barrett has been awful all season, and he turns up for two games in the playoffs. I've told you guys on here, if he has one above average trait, it's being clutch. I don't know why, but he shows up in big moments. Here he is again. Hey, shout out to R.J. Shout out to R.J. But with the Julius Randle hate, right? A lot of it's spreading in the the Twitter. It's like, oh, this guy's back again. He hasn't changed. I, at this point, accept it. Uh, I don't think he's built for the bright lights. He's had a lot of open shots that just haven't fallen. I'm not saying that he's completely withered away. I think he could have a good game in Cleveland. I think he probably plays better in the away environment instead of the Garden. I, don't, I don't, just don't think he play in the Garden. It's weird. But at the same time, I love Julius Randle because he was brought in with no expectations, Stephen A. Smith was handed his jersey from Max Kellerman, threw it on the ground, right? This is supposed to be a, a trash team. It was a trash move. Under the old regime, too. This was not like a Thibodeau, Leon Rose move. This was just like a garbage pick up some random guy. He ended up turning to an all-star. He's the reason we are in this position right now. If we didn't have Julius Randle, we might be playing the Bucks or the Celtics. We'd probably lose the plan. So for Knicks fans who are saying he's garbage, get him off the team. We would not be in this position right now. So shout out to RJ who's playing well. Shout out to the guys who are stepping up. But if you're taking the whole season into account, you take that man off the team, we're not in this position. So that's what I want to say on that. I just want to say, it sounds like we're like doing some sort of intervention. So now that it's my turn, I love Julius Randle because I think <laughs> <laughs> the way he like went about it, it's like we're like sitting in a circle. We're all like, hey guys, uh, my name is Saini. I've been coming to this for about a month now. And uh, Dog, the you reason know, I love I've been, Julius Randle. I've been supporting him for the last two years. I nah, call his first all-star appearance. I've called the my the second Randall all-star appearance his club. resurgence. It's Hoops been a good here. ride. Hoop, but it's it's out definitely here. a double-edged sword seeing him on the bench when they win. I'm not going to lie. He's out here screen recording Julius Randle clips to make edits, right? So that's how you know he's 10 toes in, but he's out here cropping that. But anyway, um, I mean, I've been saying it from the start, and I'm happy that it's coming, it's it's flourishing into a, a W take by me once again, because, I mean, come on, right? Uh, <laughs> the Knicks, I said, like Hoop said, no, I said, t- it's say the what Knicks else you said about easy. the Knicks. Say what else you said about the Knicks at the start of the season. That was a hot take. Uh, oh, that was a hot take. Uh, oh. That was a hot take. And uh, we did that Kemba episode. Walker we did that the episode. Same level as Derek Rose. <laughs> They're like this. They're like this. They're like this. <laughs> how many thirty-point games man. has Kemba Walker Day had this season? How many games? Zadik how many thirty? Bay. How many thirty-point Kelly games? Olenek. How many thirty-point games has Kemba Walker had? How many thirty-point games has Derek Rose had this season? Anyways, uh, I'm joking. I'm not making that. Cheap shot. We. I'm gonna say this for five seconds and go back to playoff talk because now you got me pissed off. We deliberately went into that episode saying, guys, come up with a hot take. That was a hot take I came up with, okay? Like, I pulled it. It's supposed I, I, to be based I believed in it. something. It's based in my heart. Anyway, uh, I, I really believed in Cade Cunningham, okay? Anyway, listen. Uh, back to this Nick playoff talk. If and, 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 and an interesting point to bring up is the second round because no Giannis, and I don't know the timetable for Giannis to come back. After game two, I was like, okay, the Bucks still easily got this in the bag. They caught Miami lacking, whatever. When the hell did Duncan Robinson start making shots again? When the hell did that man step on the court and start making shots again? I'm like, I forgot he existed. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna keep it 100. Like, I'm gonna keep it real. I'm not, no disrespect to Duncan Robinson, but we can all agree he went ghost this season. Six points on like 30% shooting for the season. Like, we can agree that he d- is not playing up to his contract, right? Didn't he have DNPs, like a lot of them? Yeah, like he was Bro, not. Like, Pat was Riley terrible. is a genius. He sat on his hands at the trade deadline, all for this dude to show up like Batman. In the playoffs <laughs> against, in, in the series, you need to win most. Because if Miami against wins Milwaukee. the series, they have a very good shot. Because then they play the Knicks, and I, I think it's a very bad, tough battle. I think the Knicks will be harder than Milwaukee if they don't have Giannis, right? I think the Knicks is going to be a harder series uh, if Giannis stays out. But out of nowhere, okay, Jimmy Neutron starts pulling up again, and he's going like four for six from three, and Miami's lacking from the perimeter, right? So you have out of nowhere Kyle Lowry starting to have like legacy games, and Jimmy Butler does what Jimmy Butler usually does. Um, I love it. And and we're really starting to see, like, again, the lack with the, the biggest issue with Milwaukee on their offensive side is their perimeter game, right? 
Like, they're not as good from the perimeter as other teams. They don't shoot the ball enough. So they're allowed to get away with that because of Giannis. Without Giannis, what happens? They get caught lacking, right? Because now when Duncan Robinson is out here making shots, Max Struess is out here making shots, Kyle Lowry is pulling up with that big bunda following him everywhere he goes, right? <laughs> it's like, bro, how do you stop that? How do you stop that? So it's going to be interesting to see. And the only reason I bring up that series, I know we're on the New York because it's like, is there a path for New York to go to the Eastern Conference Finals? That's a discussion that can be had. We can have that discussion. And I told this to Saney before the show. I'm not going to get too caught up because remember, the series is not over and I can see Cleveland bouncing back to an extent. The New York Knicks this season, I believe, like 99% sure, they're 3-1 and one against Boston. They have their number. They were a bunch of not only just like good games and good wins for the Knicks, exciting games. I'm just talking about exciting basketball. The, the Celtics probably have an edge in that series. But that would be the playoff series that I like of my life. I, I've said it the whole series, the, the whole, the whole I think season, that's only, man. Is that, is, isn't this not, wouldn't that be Hoops' like fourth playoff series of his life? Is there, is well, there much competition the, to compare? Of the ones like, that I actually like have been watching basketball I, I and like, following I'm the Nick. team, it would I was be just like, a joke. My, that would be my third or fourth. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, you, you left a bad, the bad time to leave, bro. This is not a bad time to leave. The hell? Let's segue into just the next segment. Good. But, yeah, yeah. Let's, um, that's a perfect segue. Z, I know you want to spit, so I'm going to mute myself for a while. Boy, sitting here talking about something I left at the perfect time. Perfect time for what? The perfect time for Stephen A. Smith to yell some more? I'm like, oh, damn, about none of that. I'm going to tell you something. This morning I wake up, right? Uh, my girl asked me, ZZ Huncho, um, are you excited to record today? <laughs> ZZ Huncho. I say, uh, yeah, we signed a contractual agreement. <laughs> I call her a nickname. She called me a nickname. Nonetheless, um, <laughs> she said, are you excited for the show today? I was like, let me tell you, let me tell you something. Depending on what happens after 3.30 will depend on how excited I am for the show today. I was alluding, of course, to the Golden State Warriors and the Kings game four. Um, the Warriors escaped by one point, uh, 126, 125, to tie the series up 2-2. Now, I said before or after game two, after right after, that the Sacramento Kings would not win a game in Chase Center. Uh, I was right about that. Um, this one was a, li- was a little bit of a stressor, I'm not going to lie, because uh, Steph forgot, Steph had a Chris Webber moment, and oh my God, Steve Kerr was on his knees praying to the Lord above uh, to reverse what just happened, but Lord have mercy. Um, let's talk about, for some reason, I just want to talk about Draymond Green. Uh, I said after game three that going into game four, Draymond Green is going to be an X factor because Sabonis had to deal with the crowd, obviously booing him when he checked in and any time that he touched the ball in game three, but he had to deal with that without having the luxury of looking up at Draymond Green. Uh, Now we get to game four, Draymond Green has returned. And when we talk about key defensive plays, Draymond Green always comes to my mind. I'm talking about late in the fourth quarter. If you, for as much as I, look for Steph Curry to make an offensive play or Klay Thompson to knock down a three-point shot. When I need a stop, I am looking for Draymond Green. It is that simple. Uh, in the fourth quarter, Sabonis goes up, gets a rebound, goes up over, I believe, Wiggins and Draymond Green. Out of nowhere, Green comes from under the rim and sends that thing back. A couple of plays later, the Kings need a bucket. They go right back to guess who? Sabonis. Sabonis gets the ball, puts the ball on the deck. Draymond Green said, nah, uh, give me that. I need all of that. And we go right back down the floor. Now, that was the most chaotic last 44 seconds of basketball that I've ever seen in my life. But I like it because it is the playoffs, bro. And I need to give the Kings flowers. I And mainly De'Aaron Fox, bro. 38 points in 40 minutes. When you are out there. 31 shots. The, on, 30, on 31 shots. 14 to 31. 4 of 11 from 3. 9 rebounds. 5 assists. Like, oh my God. When you're talking about hero ball, look no further than De'Aaron Fox. Uh, I said after game two when Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox were literally tag teaming the Warriors, that if Malik Monk doesn't give you that, then the Warriors really have a chance here. And I mean that the Warriors are going to be the ones that need to ensure that that doesn't happen. And I'm talking mainly if Malik Monk is giving you 25 off the bench, you might be screwed. And it's coming off the bench because you need something to either counteract that or you need your starters to be on all cylinders. And tonight Malik Monk shot, uh, let me see, let me see, make sure I get this right, 5 of 14. That is what we needed right there. Because if he's hitting at least half of his shots, this game is a different. It's a different story altogether. He took a bunch of bad shots down the stretch too. He did, and, and I want to. Speaking of bad shots, let me point out. Uh, 
Harrison Barnes. I was just going to say that. I am so glad. I am I so glad that. that we traded you away. I am so glad hey. that we moved you away. Because let me tell you something. The last memory I had of Harrison Barnes in Golden State was the 2016 Finals. And let me tell you something. Harrison Barnes went two for 22, if I'm not mistaken, in that series. And the majority of those shots were open threes. Now, as, as fate would have it, seven years later, he ends up on the Sacramento Kings. They need a game winner down the stretch. The Aaron Fox, I said it. They double team Fox. We're good. I live with whoever else shoots. I don't care. Just get it out of Fox's hands. By the basketball gods' fate, we end, it ends up in Harrison Barnes' hands, shooting a pretty, uh, pretty open shot at first. I mean, Steph's contesting, so you open. don't really, you know. Uh, and they would have been in for Steph Curry's mouth winner. of all mouths. Like it just, like I was like, no, it'll, it'll make me sick to my stomach if Harrison Barnes hits this shot. And what does he do? Fifty. That's what we needed, brother. That's literally what we needed. Thank you, Harrison Barnes. Thank you. I'll say this. Warriors 2-2, baby. I want to I wanna run two things by you, Z. Uh, number one, Harrison Barnes forgot he doesn't play for the Warriors tonight. Um, and number two, what do you mean by, oh, I was so happy when we traded Harrison Barnes? When do you think they traded Harrison Barnes, I, they, when they, did I you... knew it. I knew it well, yeah, the well, entire so, so, time. Hold on. We, hold on, we guys. traded hold on. Harrison Barnes. Hold on. Hold on. Now, obviously... I may not have ran my contractual obligations by you Dude, guys back in like July. like he was a Pistons fan back for a July. season. Oh, oh, You oh, were always with the oh. Dubs. I was always with the Dubs. As my Western Conference team, as I have aforementioned before, I always had an Eastern Conference team the same way I have a Western Wait, so Conference team. Wait, so the Dubs team. were always your Western Conference team? Since, since 2015. Oh, but Never I thought you were up. always a Derrick Rose fan. Never what happened in Minnesota? Well, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. What you're happened right, in Minnesota? Right. The, oh, not the Minnesota now years. Say, now not the Minnesota years. I forgot. <laughs> now I forgot the Minnesota seats. years. Oh, he's cooked. I did forget the Minnesota years. But, hey, and also 48 hours of, of I was a 48 hour. I was a fan of the Utah Jazz for 48 hours. Let me just say that. Uh, that was that was, that was was a very tough two days for me. But nonetheless, uh, despite when Derrick Rose was in the West, which was once, every other time was in the East, Warriors were my team, right? Now, nonetheless, let's just get back on point here. The Warriors have tied the series up 2-2. And everybody after game two was talking, light the beam, light the beam. Kings fans, Sandy was talking about in the last show about all the Warriors bandwagons like pop out of the blue. I ain't never seen that many Sacramento fans. I'm telling you that right now. And I'm talking about during the regular season too. Fans are coming out of the cut right now. Why? Because everybody wants to see the Warriors down. But let me tell you something. Light them beams. How about this? Fuck them beams. Light them rings. How about that? Give me, give me a little, we're Clay Thompson. Let me get a little Clay Thompson love. Light them rings. How about that? The infinity stones. They count them up right now. And the Kings looking a little worried. That momentum then shifted. Oh, my God. Lord, have me up, buckle up them pants, boy. I'm telling you right now. Getting wicked on you. <laughs> Real wicked. You're talking about, like, the Twitter army that just hates the Warriors, or you're talking about actual Kings fans about, popping I'm out the I'm talking about games. the Discord. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Twitter. Oh, I'm talking about okay. TikTok. I'm talking about, I mean, y'all both alluded to it. Well, I'm tired rooting of seeing for the, the Kings, too, wait, so man. you can count me in. Yeah, yeah, you, you can count them yeah, beams I want them out. beams lit. I want them beams lit. We're I'll knocking them beams out like yeah. fight night. Shall I take off? I'll say this. Uh, Steph Curry, a rare veteran, mis a very bad mistake from Steph on that tech. I don't know what he was thinking. Because um, that, they, 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 they really like, bro, like if they lost on that shot and they lose that series, the discussion breaks out where it's like that, that Curry, that tech that Curry picks up would have been like the domino effect of them losing that series. I truly believe that. Because if they win that, that's they're uh, they're down three one, and they have to play in Sacramento in Game Five, and they were up by five before Steph Curry gets that tech right. So then it's like a discussion breaks out where it's like, it, did they lose because of Steph? And that's a fair argument to bring up because like, you can't do that. And I think Steph, and we're never gonna bring it up because again the Kings didn't capitalize. But that's a mistake where like if another guy like Westbrook did that, and I'm bringing up Russ, we're not hearing the end of it. I don't think anybody's going to mention that Steph Curry tech. I haven't seen anything on social media yet. I haven't seen anybody break out about it. And it's because, to be fair, the Warriors won. But Steph also missed a go-ahead bucket. And the Kings have another chance to go at it, right? So Steph gets the tech, lets them score four total points because it was a Malik Monk free throw and then a Darian Fox three, goes down the court and misses a bucket. And then it puts the Kings in a position to score again. So the Kings would have scored six points in about 20 seconds when they were down five. All due to two Steph Curry slip-ups. We're never going to hear that, right? But that's something that we have to bring up because it's like you can't make those mistakes. And the Warriors got bailed out. But if we start making those mistakes it, it, only in the first round, you start playing some teams that actually play some defense because the Kings don't play defense, right? All these games have been high scoring. I love it. I'm not a hater of it. But I just think that uh, some more light should be shed on how Steph 
uh, played that, those final minutes. Even though it's Steph Curry and he puts him in a position to win, I 100% agree. And he, a guy like Westbrook, and I'm bringing up Westbrook again, if he had the exact same game but he made those two mistakes, what are, what's Twitter going to say? What's Instagram going to say? I I mean, yeah, it, it's definitely more on Russ. But for the general consensus, like Steph played from what I saw. I, I took a 30-minute nap, so I missed the a lot of the third quarter. But from what I saw, Steph was cooking. Um like transition threes, the pump fake, someone blows by him, like just a lot of big buckets. So if Russ had that kind of game and blew, you know, a mini play like that, it's not like they're crucifying him, but I could definitely understand. They have, has a, they have with that. And against the Kings too, the game where the, uh, both teams scored over 170 points, the exact same situation. People were crucifying him for that? Yeah, man. It was all, Russ, host of highlights, Bleacher you... <laughs> Report, all of them posted that exact same clip and the uh, caption was like, yeah. the caption was like, Westbrook loses the gotcha. game for the Clippers or something. Yeah. But it's like, bro, Russ was going off. And it's like, yeah. and it was against the Kings too. It was the exact same situation. And if anything, I would think Steph Curry's was worse because it resulted in four points when the Kings were down, right? So it's like, and it was in where, the playoffs. I, I, I just want to see the same energy match. Where it's like, and I, I'm not hating on Steph. I'm not saying Steph is bad or anything. <laughs> I'm just saying we need to start calling out superstars for mistakes because nobody's going to talk about Steph Curry's mistake like that. And I think that it's 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 kind of hypocritical. I agree. Um... If we're this the playoff series that we're not talking about, what there's Denver, Minnesota. Nobody Anthony cares. Edward says it's not done, but I mean, nobody cares about that. He's supposed to say that. He's a dog, though. Like two back to back forty point dog? games. Is he a dog? Anthony Edwards. Yeah, he had back to back forty point games, but then in the first game he was ghost, and the play in he was ghost. Oh, he's like twenty one. Okay. What? I'm I'm twenty one. <laughs> hey, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I'm playing. No, I get his young. I get his young. I think Anthony Edwards is great. I'm not calling him a dog yet. I need the consistency to be there to call him a dog. Sure. Um, can we talk about Fox? Con- like, continuing with Fox, uh, I want to get to the Lakers and Grizzlies because John Morant with an injured hand, right? They're down 30 points in what is the early second quarter. Um, they bring it to within 10 after Dylan Brooks sits down. Oh, how what a surprise. But John Morant ended the game with like, I think it was 45, 8, and 13 or something like that. He scored 22 straight points for the Grizzlies. It's hilarious to me how ever, whenever John Morant or De'Aaron Fox breaks away in their discussion, the other one catches up somehow. Remember, this has been years on since they were like sophomores in the league, whereas the Ja De'Aaron comparison. Jaw gets hype. He he does well in in a play in game or whatever. And De'Aaron Fox is down here. Oh, Jaw's much better than De'Aaron. De'Aaron is the clutch player of the year. Has a crazy season. I think De'Aaron's now better. But John Morant keeps proving to other people who he is, and they keep just going back and forth. Are these two guys going to be like two of the best guards in the league? Are we just going to keep having these discussions? I yeah. I, I and I think there could be. Um... A conversation that breaks out in the future where it's like, who is the best NBA uh, NBA guard in, or uh, guard in the league, John Morant or Darren Fox? Like they might go toe to toe at some point. Um, and in my opinion, I know you think Darren Fox is better. Personally, I would take John Morant. I think Jaw is better. Uh, it's the difference is not insane. I think both of them are average defense. Like, eh. And offensively, they're both great. I think De'Aaron's got a more polished mid-range game, which I like better for big moments. That's I think all it is. I think John Morant can win a game. I think John Morant puts his team in a better position to win a game, though, because we've always seen success from De'Aaron Fox this season, and it was after a major change in the coaching and then bringing in some bonus. Right, John Morant, you put him in a playoff series. I could put my money out that he's going to be the best player in that series against anybody. Right, like he 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 turns up no matter what. Um, De'Aaron Fox, for example, played great, and I'm not hating on De'Aaron Fox. Do not think I'm hating on De'Aaron Fox whatsoever. But if you watch that game, especially in the fourth quarter, he hit a lot of big shots. There were also a lot of moments where he was ball hogging. Like, it seemed like every possession, he did not want to give the ball up. And it showed in the final possession as well when Steph Curry, who should not be doing that to you, is locking your ass up and you have to kick out to Harrison Barnes because that's the only person. Because, look, they covered him up, right? So the only yeah, direction... He, he, he got lucky. him for a second, but he he was getting doubled at that point. He would have threw that up if Draymond you know didn't what? Fair, fair, fair. Draymond the final Green. possession, he got doubled. But I'm just saying, possession before that, he misses a floater. It barely nicks the front rim, right? Possession before that, like, he hit a big three, of course. I'm not hitting on the Air Fox again, but he took 31 shots, right? You're saying Ja has that it factor right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can see that. And, uh, uh, and again, Jaren Fox is really good. I, I I don't want, and that's the one thing I hate about comparing players because it always sounds like you're hating on the other player, right? I'm not right. hating on Jaren Fox. I'm not saying he played bad in the fourth quarter. I'm just saying there were a lot of selfish plays. And when you only lose by one point, 
like every play matters. And I'm going to yeah. pick apart pick apart and dissect at both sides and be like, why was this only a one point game? Right? Because this could have been realistically if Fox doesn't have two possessions where he just breaks it and doesn't kick the ball out or anything. And yes, Monk took some stupid shots. I'm not I'm not saying only Fox was taking dumb shots, but it's like that whole team seemed to be it, it see the play seemed to be if they were doing an inbound, throw it to Sabonis. Sabonis stays at the top of the key and Fox just runs around. They give the ball to Fox and Fox just tries to do something. It's like there needs to be some variety with the Sacramento Kings, especially in the clutch, because now it's becoming obvious how to guard them in the final minute. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, when I'm when trying to dissect two players like Fox and and Ja, it's hard because like it feels like you're nitpicking with what you want. Like Hoop said, I prefer Dar- I mean, uh, Darren Fox's uh, mid range over Jaws, but that's mainly because I've seen him hit that a lot more consistent- consistently than I've seen Ja hit that, even with three point shooting. Especially so far this season, you can even point to in the first round alone. But I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if Fox is coming down the court trail and, and he gets an open three, he can knock that thing down a lot better than Jaw. And even with Le- what LeBron said about how the Grizzlies were guarding Jaw, it was a matter of like, they're going to guard him the same way that he's been guarded in previous postseasons, which is load up the paint and make him shoot us out of the game and we'll live or die with whatever we get. Once Jaw gets past that, I feel like people will be able to look at him as more of a dynamic score compared to the or compared between the two of them. Uh defense defensively, I'm taking Jaw. I don't know if it's because of all of the insane blocks that I've seen. Both of them are athletic freaks, but I just feel like Jaw on the defensive side of the ball is able to track things a lot better up in the air than De'Aaron Foxes. So it's hard. It's really hard for me to sit there and literally tell you, oh, I want this player, oh, I want that one. Because offensively, while Jaw can create for his own, create for himself and is a f- phenomenal finisher at the rim and things to that magnitude, it's it's just difficult because I, when I see Fox, it's like Fox looks like he knows exactly what he's about to do when he has the ball in the clutch. And it's like literally scary. Like he can piece you up if he's going to like the Draymond shot, the shot he hit over Draymond. Draymond, you notice he backed off of him a little bit because he knew he could get past him. But De'Aaron Fox is recognizing and is like, I'm going to shoot it in your face and wets it up. It's just like there's nothing you can do. The mid ranges. De'Aaron Fox's mid-range shot, he shoots it to the moon every single time. The same thing with that little floater. It's the same exact type of shot, uh, shot same arc on the shot. It's just difficult to guard. And yeah, I, I watch Brunson all the time. It's the same thing. Like yeah, I get, it's, it, it's just a ton of arc on the fall away. It's so insane. And it's like, and to me, I'm looking at it like, if you were able to hit shots like that, you're a shot master. You're not, not just a tough shot taker, but you're a shot master. You've been working on that. I can tell. Simple one dribble pull ups. You can just look at his game and see where he's been practicing this specific move a lot of the time. With Jaw, it's like we're kind of waiting for him to develop, I guess, more of an efficient jump shot. Um, because his mid range is like it's 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 almost respectable, but Fox is just is just way more respectable. So it's like it's really a toss up of what you want. But I I like the comparison and it and it's tough. Like Sandy said, you're giving credit to both players. I tried to do that right there. I'm giving credit to both players. Both players are different players in certain elements, but. It, it, it'd be really hard for me to pick one or the other. It's just a matter of what my team looks like, right? I'll take Shea over both of them. I'll take Shea over both of them. <laughs> Fair. I like that, actually. I do. You get defense and you yeah, get Yeah, I, I do that as well. Um, Can we talk about Kawhi Leonard? Yes, we can. Oh, I, can I talk about Kawhi? Oh, bro, I oh. feel so bad for Steve Ballmer, the most energetic owner in sports, courtside, every game, right, would live in and lives and dies based on his basketball team, uh, had all of them dress up in construction clothing to unveil in their new arena. He is like the team dad, right? Like their biggest fan. And his two best players that he was this hyped up over can't play basketball without getting injured. Isn't that sad? Not to mention, the one guy might be the best player in the world right now. That's a discussion. That's a discussion. I'll I'll say this. I'll say this. I don't feel bad for Steve Ballmer, number one, because he's a billionaire. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I don't think he's like stressing it that much, if I'm being honest, uh, because it's all a business. Number two, okay, I didn't know we were load managing in the playoffs. Day to day, he doesn't want to. I heard he's not load managing. I'm not going to tell you the, the source. I I hope he's not load managing. I'm making a joke. The fact that we actually have to look into it's the playoffs. (laughs) <laughs> I, I heard he didn't sound like it was a joke. Load managing. I've, heard, I've heard other people say that he's load managing, which is complete cap. I heard his knees just break down, um, and they need yeah, like time to 
hundred percent. Um, and that's the, I will the, say the this, time where he can't play anymore. The, but. the Clippers probably have, but not even just this season. Like if you go back that year where Chris Paul and Blake Griffin get injured ten minutes from between each other, right? Like they just seem to always deal with their two top two players getting screwed. Um, and again, we're seeing it. Like, have we seen Kawhi and Paul George fully healthy throughout a whole playoff run? Other than that one year they lost against the Mavericks, and that was just a crumble. Like that was just that team crumbling apart. Like that, that they barely. How many games have they? I, I guarantee you, they've missed more games than played together. One hundred and ten percent. I can promise you that. And it's they just should like, have kept the depth over Paul George. I agree with that. That would have been insane to think about. Like them having. We, what we was saw it, what Kawhi did. Shea? Uh, yeah. How much depth did they give away though? They only gave up Gallinari and Shea, and Shea wasn't I'm not the player even he was. Saying, I'm not even they didn't give up. They like... didn't give up much depth for for uh, Paul George, but they gave up draft picks. They gave up five draft picks. I'm that saying was the... if you use that to get depth instead of having Kawhi paired up with a superstar, I heard an interesting take saying that Kawhi just works better when the roster around him is built to win, and he's the topper. For example, Toronto. They were a great regular season team. You know, obviously it was LeBron, and they didn't have the topper. But they had guys like Lowry, Siakam, uh, who is it? Well, they brought in Marcus, like guys who could win without him and have a respectable record. Like it was a deep team so that when he came in, it was just like it was over for the league. When you pair him up with another superstar and you're banking on that other superstar to play 75, 80 games, especially when that superstar has an injury history and his name is Paul George, it's just it wasn't a good fit. So you need the stars to align for the Clippers to win a championship. I said in my predictions earlier this season that it would be Bucks Clippers in the finals. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. I also hate that my three favorite players right now are Julius Randle, Kawhi Leonard, and Kyrie Irving. Because there's something wrong with all of them. I hate that. It's tough. It really is tough um, to try and analyze the Clippers. Especially, I, I agree with you on the Steve Ballmer point. I feel bad for him. Uh, bro is always really, really happy. Uh, when his team is doing well, and really, really, really sad. He gives that old team. man fist bump on the <laughs> sidelines when they when they score a dunk. He's like, yeah! It's like, it's like hey, pal, did you see that? Yeah, Steve. It's like, come on now. <laughs> I feel bad for him because... <laughs> you know, like at the end of movies happen. where the main character will like jump up in the air and he'll like, freeze frame, yeah. <laughs> and like some like song will play? It's like, that's Steve Ballmer every time. It's literally. Anytime the Clippers win, it's, it is sad. It's so sad. The Kawhi Leonard and Paul George experiment to me is one that I think needs to be studied uh, 20 years from now. Uh, they need to look back and just be like, this is what happens when you push all of your chips in for one guy, like a Kawhi Leonard who basically told the front office, hey, look, I'll come play for you, but I need you to do this for me, right? Kawhi had an opportunity to go play for, with LeBron James and said, no, imagine, just imagine what that would have looked like. But instead, he chose the JV squad and I commended him for doing that because I was like, you know what? Kawhi's sitting there and saying to himself, I just won a championship for Toronto. Y'all saw me, like, like Hoop said, you give me a team, a good team, a solid team. You give me guys like Van Vliet, give me guys like Siakam, give me guys like Marc Gasol, and Kyle Lowry as a second option from that veteran presence or whatever you need. Like, and a good coach in Nick Nurse that year. You're going to be straight, right? Fast forward all the way to L.A. and to Saini's point, We've seen, what, them, uh, Kawhi and Paul George together in the bubble, uh, and then 2021 was, like, for a split second before, because I don't think, if I'm not mistaken, Paul George didn't make it to the conference finals with them uh, before Kawhi blew his knee out, if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, he made Paul it George, after. Right? Yeah, yeah. So then, it's just the experiment, like, year by year, it's just, like, it's wild. Now they're in a situation where they're down 3-1 to a team that they should beat, if healthy. Um, and it's just like, damn, what do you, what do, you do? I don't know if I'm Steve Ballmer, uh, if, I, if I'm in the front office for the Clippers, what I do after this season if they if they lose in five and then they're bounced again. Like, what do you really do? Do you do you look to trade away some of the star guys and, I don't know, start over? Because you've invested so much in four years' time to get the best that you could possibly get up to where you are now where you have Russell Westbrook on the team with you for, for that for that on-name value, like it's our, our on-paper value. It's just... I don't know what they I don't know what they can do. I don't know how to really like look at it and and evaluate it because it's really tough. Like they they they've been the favorites or at least top 5 for uh at, at least 3 of the 4 years that this has been a thing or four and a half, however many it's been. But it, I, I yeah, I can't I just cannot I don't know what the answer is. The basketball gods need to be on their side. It, that's 
simply what it's falling, <laughs> what, what it's coming down to. And what uh, is so aggravating about specifically this round and this mm-hmm. year is that they're playing Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, and Devin Booker in the first round. And that team deserves to lose. I don't know if right. you guys saw my breakdown on how they're playing awful basketball uh, when they don't give DeAndre Ayton the ball. We mock DeAndre Ayton all the time. I am, I've am, i done it. Like I call him soft. He doesn't call for the ball. But at the same time, they don't give him the ball. So why would he try to fight for position? Why would he grab an offensive rebound? Dog, they're playing 2K in my park. They're chucking up threes, these contested middies, and he's just grabbing a rebound, throwing it back out. And what's he going to say no to Chris Paul? He's going to say no to Kevin Durant. They deserve to lose. And they <laughs> should have They should have lost that game. It should be a 2-2 series right now, if I'm being honest. Yeah. And Kawhi Leonard didn't play two games. Paul George didn't play four. Imagine. And they're barely losing. And they're barely, barely. losing these games. Yes. Like, I can't wait for the yes. Suns to get to the second round and get their ass Dog, beat. I think they're getting wiped by Denver. They're getting wiped. They're getting wiped. They're not going to be... Because I'll say this. I'll say this, okay? Suns, defensively, trash. Trash. Right, Clippers offensively they've been great, but the Suns are miles ahead of them. Right, but the fact that the Clippers have been able to keep up says something. Wait till you start playing Denver. Wait till you play Denver and their set pieces. Wait till you have Jokic running the r- r- running or having the ball in his hand, making all these Aaron Gordon cuts, and DeAndre Ayton's ass isn't gonna stop shit. Because right now DeAndre Ayton's barely stopping Ivaka Zubak. Right, <laughs> like they're 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 barely getting by with Zubak and Plumlee as the center. Wait till you have Jokic to deal with. Right, so. Wait till you have yeah. an actual team. Wait till you have Aaron Gordon driving on your ass, chucking elbows in your face, and you're like, well, well, what do we do now? Right? And the Dollar Tree Carmelo MPJ is going to light yeah. it up. Jamal Seriously. Murray has already shown flashes of his bubble form. It's like you can't really double anybody on the Nuggets because they're all shooters, right? Like KCP, right. bro, if you double me and I, and I have to kick out to a KCP shot, I'm fine with that. I'll live with that if I'm Denver, right? Because KCP will make at least 35% of them, at least. He's a great shooter, right? Then you have MPJ, Murray, and Jokic as your main guys. Jokic probably, you know, shooting wise, like I'm not going to keep Jokic on the. I'm not going to rely no, on Jokic on the premier. But like it's Jokic, doubles, right? Exactly. Right? So all I'm going to say is, Suns got lucky, and I believe I don't know if I don't know if Kawhi's playing Game Five. There was no uh, talk on that. If Kawhi comes back though, and they win a game, and then somehow PG comes back, like some miracle, PG comes back earlier. Because there's been some talk that he might come back. We have a series. That's all I'm going to say. So let me ask you all this question. And it's, uh, uh, did y'all see the Stephen A. Smith quote uh, about Kawhi? About, he uh, said he should be like the worst Kawhi superstar. Kawhi Leonard should right? be on the list of one of the worst superstars this idiot. game has ever I seen. I hate Stephen A. Smith more and more every day. <laughs> not his fault his knees can't hold him up. I'm happy he's it's still not, playing. It's tough. It, it, it's not really his fault for him getting paid money. Right? It's not <laughs> like he could use it to cure. Right? He's not curing his body. If I was trash, if I was not a trash NBA player, I'm not calling Kawhi trash, but if I was, let's say, a player who is overrated, right? And a team's like, oh, we'll give you $150 million, $200 million. I'm going to be like, no, I'm overrated. Then cut the price. <laughs> no, nah, no, you keep it, man. I'm overrated. I'm overrated. Are, are you sure, bro? <laughs> no, nah, man, I get injured. I get injured, bro. I got knee problems, <laughs> man. I don't want the money. I, I don't want it. Like, what are you talking imagine, about? Imagine Gordon Smith? Hayward turned down that contract. Bro. Yeah, You're imagine Gordon idiot. Hayward being like, mm, I see in the future. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, screw off. Like, he took a bag, and people want to get mad about him taking that bag. Even after, when he signed a bag with Charlotte. Oh, why did why did you get $30 million? I don't know. I got $30 million. A year. Yeah, like, bro, what? Like, if you were in get my, off my shoes, nuts. Like, what, what are we, what are we, I hate when people complain about that. I, when I complain about a contract, I complain about the team, the GM, making that decision. I don't say, oh, this guy's making, like, for example, Zion. Oh, Zion's making $50 million. Okay. Wait, if the team's going to offer him the money, I'm going to take the money. I'm not going to say no. Get mad at the ball doing the suit in the front office, man. Yeah, get mad at, literally, get mad at the GM. Why are we talking about the player? They're, they really expect them to be like, no, nah, the fans have always had my back. I'm going to take a $100 million pay cut. Hell no, because the fans, we know fans, are just going to turn on their players instantly. Loyalty doesn't exist anymore, let's be honest. On oh, God. Damian Lillard isn't loyal. His family just lives in Oregon, and he gets paid $60 million a year. Let's get that <laughs> back straight, by the way. Bradley Beal isn't loyal. Bradley Beal just got paid $50 million, which he would have never got anywhere else, right? So this isn't loyalty. This is money. And players, if and I respect to... it, because players understand that in the flash, in a second, if a team can make more money by trading you away or make a decision that works best, they're not. They're going to get rid of your ass. They don't care about you, Right? The only guys that stick around on a team are like Udonis Haslam's who are getting paid vet minimums and no other team will take them anyway. Or like a Nick Collison who it's like, 
what's the point of trading you? The fans years. love you. We make more money with you staying here, and we pay you nothing, right? I so mean, I, I, that's I stand but, on that with the, like, with the Damian Lillard stuff. He's not you're loyal. Damian Lillard's yeah. not loyal, he's, and he's always like, "Yeah, I'm not loyal." No, nah, his family lives in Portland. He doesn't want to move, and he's getting it back. Why would he move? And he literally said on JJ Reddick's uh, JJ Reddick thing, he's like, "Man, I don't really care about basketball. I just like going to see my grandma and hanging out with my family." I respect, what, I'm not yes. him. I respect <laughs> it. I, I respect, respect it too. But he literally admitted, he's like, "Bro, I just like to. I'm a normal guy outside of basketball. I just like to spend time exactly. with my family." And it's like, imagine you get to go spend time with your family in a city that freaking loves you because you've been there for so long. You've done you've done some amazing things there. I'm not hating on Damian Lillard, right? And you make sixty million dollars a year. Why would you want to leave? To get, Why would to you get want a to leave? shiny, a shiny piece of to get metal a shiny that sits piece on a shelf? Metal? Sits Let's on a be shelf. honest. Like, yeah, winning a championship is probably crazy, but in my opinion, okay, and this is coming <laughs> from me, I don't know about you guys. I would rather make two hundred and fifty million dollars and spend time with my family than win a ring in a city that I don't want to be in and make like one third that money, because now I have generations set for life. Like, obviously, you're still making millions. But I don't think people can really fathom, like, understand how much money Damian Lillard is making, right? No, no, no. Like, he's right. making more than, like, the C... Like, by the way, to put it in perspective, the CEO of Coca-Cola pockets $50 million a year. That's how much he gets after everything. The CEO of Coca-Cola, that's how much he makes at the end of everything, right? Damian Lillard makes over $50 million a year. Damian Lillard He said, is hold pocketing. my nuts. Damian Lillard, I, I mean, obviously, I don't want to say maybe the tax is coming to play and maybe he's not pocketing 50 million, of course. But just to put it in perspective, the CEO of Coca I'll even pull it up right now. I heard that I was watching a, uh, an investor talk about this on this podcast. The CEO of Coca Cola pockets $50 million a year. Look at how much Damian Lillard is making for playing basketball. And see, you calling the, the, it loyalty? I'm calling it the smartest business decision in mankind. It's, what makes the business decision even more smarter is that Damian Lillard changes his perspective on where he is in his career every two months. That is what pisses me off because it's like, Dave, if you came out on the record and said, and I'm not talking you hopping on JJ Reddick's podcast or another NBA player's podcast, whatever. I need you to legitimately sit there in a press conference and say, I am not here against my will. I am here because my family loves Portland and I love being in Portland. And I don't care about a ring. I care about this bread. I care about my family. And I'll be like, yeah, okay, cool. Not you saying oh, he does need to uh, say that. I don't want. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want. Uh, I don't want to go through a rebuild. But but you're also saying I believe I can win in Portland. That that shit ain't gonna slide. Listen, no. I, I I I made a mistake, and this is going to really put things into perspective for you. The CEO of Coca Cola makes twenty four point six million a year. Bro, Evan Fournier is in. That he's in that range. <laughs> like, that's that's what you guys got to understand. He sits in a these padded players. chair for 82 games. That's what you guys got to understand. These players he are living the luxurious year, lifestyle. People, like, people got to understand that there's, like, maybe, like, like I'd say 5, 10% of NBA players actually care about winning a ring, actually care about their legacy. I don't think any other, I, I, I genuinely, in this era, with the money being made, I don't think players give a shit about their legacy. <laughs> I don't, if we're being honest. I think they care about the fans. Because obviously the fans bring energy, so I'm not saying they don't care about the team, and I'm not saying they're not loyal. I'm not saying they don't they're not passionate about the game. I'm not saying that, but I don't think players are like losing in the playoffs and then like sweating it for more than a week max, right? Like obviously winning a championship is great, and when you're Steph Curry, you've done so much, you've made so much money. At this point, you're just trying to go for legacy, right? But not everybody's Steph Curry. For example, freaking Harrison Barnes isn't chasing a legacy right now, <laughs> but he's making twenty mil a year. No, I'm serious. I'm not making. I'm not hating on. T no, I'm serious. Harrison Barnes isn't chasing a legacy. He's not going to be no LeBron James. He's not going to be a top even a hundred player of all time. There's no chance he gets to the top. He cracks even the top hundred. We can agree on that, right? No chance he cracks even the top two hundred, right? But he still probably made more money than like seventy five percent of players in NBA history. I saw a, um, so I saw the Instagram post Jericho Sims posted after that horrendous dunk contest this yeah. is not winning an nba champ right he was yeah. just chilling on a beach he's like yeah i'm good he's like literally <laughs> boo boo oh no i lost <laughs> if anything if anything and and i know we got to wrap up the episode here but if you anything, know my name now i would much rather be like for example <laughs> terrence ross you know how terrence ross was on the magic for so long yeah i would much rather have a career like terrence ross he's just, where you're just on Fortnite, the magic bro all he did all he did was make a bunch of money in florida he would have all of his off seasons off, so he only played basketball for how many months as a season? Right, like he had six he had, to eight. Like, he had at like basically almost half a year off every year, 
making millions of dollars. And then at the end of his career, he just joins the Suns. Nobody's going to get mad at him because he's, he's not crazy. So they're not going to be like bandwagon, bandwagon, whatever, right? They're all going to go out for him. So he literally just spends all his time Fortnite. He's a big streamer. He's enjoying, he's loving his life. Bro lives in Florida. Great weather. Always on the beach. He's a bucket too. He's a bucket too. He's like he tough. Up, Orlando loved him, right? And he was making, yeah. I, I, he had to have been making at least $10 million a year. Then he just sc scurries on over to the Phoenix. And now he has a chance at a ring with Kevin Durant. And if he wins a ring, wow, that's the 10 out of 10 NBA career experience. Terrence Ross has a 10 out of 10 NBA career experience. Started his career being a dunk guy, so everybody loved him. So he enjoyed his young years in Toronto. And Toronto was lit when Terrence Ross was there, because that's when they first got to the playoffs. He's out here posterizing Kenneth Fareed, right? Everybody loves him. Dropped 51 against the Clippers, so he's had a 51-point game. But he has had, he's had a 50-point game right, before he, in his career. Then he goes to Orlando, makes, millions, this, of dollars, I, makes I millions of dollars. Makes millions of dollars. I'm just highlighting his highlights, right? Yeah, makes millions yeah. of dollars, right? Everybody loves him. Nobody's ever hated on There's Terrence no Ross. There's no negative light on him. There's no negative light, right? Made millions of dollars. Had every basically every offseason off, so his body is always healthy. Like, he's always able to recover fully. And then now he has a chance at a ring with Phoenix real quick. And if he doesn't get it, boo-hoo. That's the perfect way to... I, I think we should add on the episode. We're, we're going really off track. But I'm, the main <laughs> point is... Damian Lillard is very happy, and I don't think he's loyal. I think he's just a money getter, and I respect it. Get the bag. I, I'm not Spawn sure how this started because we were talking about the NBA playoffs, but I'm happy we went into that because Giannis uh, came out and said that he was almost ready to retire to spend yeah. time with it. He said if his son told him to retire, right? His, his son was what, like five five months old, however old? <laughs> and he said, Dad, don't play basketball anymore. He was ready to drop drop the shoes right there, bro. And uh, <laughs> Before we go, and real quick, you know who I feel terrible for? who unfortunately got the bad end of the stick, Victor Oladipo. Oh, my God. Yes. Absolutely. Because he just, he, it came out, he tore, tore something. I, I, I really have uh, prayers up for him. It, it's it's not looking good for his career, for being honest, right? Or a guy like Lonzo Ball, too. Like, both of those guys, you go through so many injuries, and it's like, man, you're risking your health for the rest of your life. You made millions. You got to know when to call it quits. Unfortunately, that's for example, JJ Reddick said it best. JJ Reddick said he could have played another season, but he understood that he was dealing with injuries and his body couldn't handle it anymore. He hung it up. JJ Reddick, I think, had an amazing NBA career 15 years in the 15, yeah. 16 seasons, made the playoffs almost every single season he played in, except for his last one, I believe. Did it? Hangs it up, makes millions of dollars. Now he has an insane podcast and he's in the media and he's healthy and he's enjoying his life. That's the way to do it. If you're not chasing yeah. legacy, if you know you're not like a top dog let's be honest right and that and a little humility and like letting go of an ego comes with that i understand that but once you understand that man you you, you are set for the rest of your life oh god not everybody can be kabod lily but um i think we should wrap it up uh this, this was a great, great episode. episode great way to end up. that was a great talk I, I i think we should start doing that more just going off track at the end episodes and just talking about <laughs> something that people don't talk about like where else are you gonna get that talking about basketball podcast <laughs> we keep it basketball we keep a ball um my episode 67 was great. Make sure to join the Discord, the most poppin' server. We're already well, well over 2,000 members now, which is awesome. Every every episode, I, I seem think to it be was the year. throwing out a new number. I think we had like 2023. No, yeah, oh. last time I checked. It's up to 20. I, I checked the Discord while we do the things. It's Oh, it's 2023 still. So you're right. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we're doing a jersey giveaway. Uh, by the time you hear this, you'll probably have a day or two left to enroll in it. I'm starting it on Monday, April 24th. So depending on when you hear it, I think that's when the episode drops. So make sure to join it. Discord.gg slash the podcast l-o-p-o-d-c-a-s-t we appreciate you again for listening to this episode and hopefully you tune in for episode 68 peace let's go next Audrey nuts <laughs>